EC201 lecture 13. So, yesterday we were looking at uh, trying to solve the problem of finding the gate source voltage in a MOS transistor that will result in a to that end we saw that what we would do in practice given an unknown MOSFET with uh, when I say unknown MOSFET I mean a MOSFET whose threshold and the mu and C ox are unknown. If you wanted to find the gate source voltage that resulted in a specified drain current then what we do is the following we would put an ammeter in the drain the drop across the ammeter is 0 and to ensure that uh, the transistor is operating in the saturation region the drain potential is connected to a sufficiently high value which we call VDD ok and what do we do we look at the reading in the ammeter uh, the reading in the ammeter is greater than I ref which we happened to say was 100 microamperes then we know that the VGS1 applied the VGS applied is much too high so, we would have to go and reduce reduce VGS on the other hand if the ammeter reads the reading is uh, smaller than 100 microamperes then we know that the gate drive is not enough and we need to go and increase VGS. So, I mean using this process you will eventually be able to get to a state where the ammeter actually reads 100 microamperes in which case the VGS is exactly equal to the VGS1 that you are looking and one advantage of this kind of uh, technique as opposed to another one which uh, was uh, thrown about in the class is that one does not really have to assume anything regarding the characteristics of the transistor itself ok. If uh, the transistor suddenly became you know whatever cube law instead of square law this process will still ensure that the VGS1 you need to put is correctly determined because this is a iterative process which works on the what is used to change VGS we are always working on the error between so the actual drain current so we use the error which is the reference minus the drain current to vary and this must be done in the right direction. So, whenever you need to design a circuit the first thing is to sit and think about what you want to do and you can be sure of one thing if you are able to verbalize what you want to do in a clear fashion then you can always build a circuit to do it. What are all the processes involved in, in finding VGS now? We need to compare the first thing to do is to, uh, is to compare the re desired current that you want with you want to compare the drain current in the transistor with what you want and what did we say was comparison yesterday subtraction is equivalent to comparing correct. So, if the result of the subtraction process is negative then you know that one quantity is larger than the other if it is positive you know it is the other way around. What is the easiest way of subtracting two currents? How can you subtract two currents? So, we need to find I ref minus I D alright and for the time being let us say that we have with us a current source which is I ref I mean and a current I D. So, how can you subtract the two of them how can you get a current which is the difference of I ref and I D. Kitchoff's current was I is, uh, is something that you can exploit to get to add currents for free if I did this what is the current in this branch I ref minus I D. So, if I just took two current sources like this and connected them hooked them up this way can somebody comment on the potential of this node voltage x if I ref is exactly equal to I D what do you think what can you say about the potential of at node x if I ref is equal to I D the potential at x yes I ref is the same as I D and I D flows to ground and I ref flows from God knows where ok. What I am asking you is what happens to the potential at x 
What is the definition of a current source? You have two identical ideal current sources connected in this fashion. Okay? When I say this fashion, it is like this. The question is, can you make any comment on the potential of node X? Okay, let me ask you, what is the potential at X? No, no more, it is not as vague as comment on the potential at X. What is the potential at X? Zero. Why? Why? What is so special about? Why do you like zero so much? Yes. About across which branch? Please note that the the current source will uh, will make sure that the current in the branch is equal to ID regardless of the voltage across that branch. That's the definition of a current source, isn't it? So the voltage, so the volt, the potential at X can be anything. However, but can you make any comment? It was something. Does it change with time? It was say 4.26 volts. If you come back tomorrow and measure the potential, will it still be 4.26 volts or will it be something else? If you want to change the potential of a node, what will you dump into that node? What physical quantity is responsible for changing the voltage of a node? It is charge. If you want to push the potential of a node up, what will you do? You will dump positive charge onto that node. Correct? If you want to pull the potential of a node down, you will extract positive charge or dump negative charge onto that node. If these two currents are exactly the same, we all agree that the potential of node X is not known. It can be anything. However, since the rate of inflow of charge into the node is exactly equal to the rate of outflow of charge, there is no net charge being dumped onto the node, which basically means that while the potential of the node is unknown, it will remain the same for all time. You understand? Does that make sense? Okay. So, the potential at X does not change. It is a simple and obvious thing, but this is what I want to point out. Now, if I Take this upside down, alright. If there are two current sources fighting with each other in this manner, and the junction X, the potential of that junction does not change at all, then what can I conclude? You can conclude that the two currents are exactly equal. Alright. Now, if IRF is greater than ID, what, are, what can you say about the potential at X? If IRF is greater than ID, more charge is being pushed. I mean, we can still not make any comment on the absolute potential at X. But you can absolutely be sure that the potential of node X will keep increasing with time. And why does it and why does it increase? The amount of charge being pumped into the node is much larger than the amount of charge being sucked out of that node. So the potential of that node has to increase. Does that make sense? There is no resistor here. Okay, these are just two ideal current sources. If the current pushing into the node is larger than the current being sucked out of the node, then the potential of the node will go on increasing and, ev at, and eventually will become... You can think of a small capacitor here. And the, uh, what happens if IRF is greater than ID? The resultant current will go into the capacitor. And what will happen to the capacitor voltage? It will go on charging up. Eventually, it will go to infinity. Okay. In practice, uh, you know, as the voltages go larger and larger, uh, you know, the current source will break. But in principle, this is what will happen. Okay. And you can think of a perfect open circuit as a capacitor whose capacitance is, is tending to zero. And by the same token, if IRF is less than ID, what happens? The potential at X decreases and eventually goes to goes to minus infinity. So, what is the moral of the story? If you want to figure out which of these two current sources is larger, one thing you can do is to connect them in a manner that they fight each other as shown here and monitor the potential at 
at the node x. If the potential at the node at node x stays constant with time, then you know that the two currents are exactly identical. Even if one current is you know larger than the other by a minuscule amount, the potential of the node will tend to either rise, go up or fall down towards infinity and the only way in which the potential can remain at the same value is when the two currents are identical. Does it make sense? I mean, it's obvious stuff. Now that you understood this, what did we want? We wanted to compare the reference current with the with the drain current in the transistor. So, what do we do? You could have I ref this way and you apply some. So, what can you say about the potential of node x? If I d is greater than I ref, what happens to node potential at node x? Keeps decreasing. Okay? But if I d was greater than I, what was our conclusion uh, regarding VGS? If I d was greater than I ref, what was the conclusion on VGS? I d was greater than I ref. It means that VGS 1 is, is too large, which means that what must you do? You must reduce VGS 1. So, if I d is greater than I ref, what happens to the potential of uh, node x? The node potential at x, if I d is less than I ref, V x, what happens to V x? Increases. And what does this mean? If the potential V x is increasing, what does it mean as far as V g s 1, V g s is concerned? It means that I ref is much larger than is larger than I D, which means that the gate source voltage is too small, which means that you must which means I must increase. So now can uh, you guys put two and two together? So if I ref is greater than I D, the not put I mean you would want to increase VGS and if IRF is greater than ID, the node potential at X is increasing. So, what can I do? I could simply connect X to VGS. You understand, this is what you were doing in the first place. You were looking at the ammeter, measuring it, comparing it with uh, IRF. If the current was smaller than IRF, you would go and tweak the voltage source. You turn the knob, crank up the knob. And what we have said is that if I ref is greater than I D, the node potential of X will increase anyway. And we wanted to increase V G S if I if I ref was greater than I D because I D was too small. One straightforward way of doing it is to simply connect X to V G. Does that make sense? So, we all realize that if I ref is greater than I D, then the node potential at X will keep increasing. Alright? And this is exactly analogous to what we were doing in the lab, which is we measure I D. We need to, we need some way of figuring out if I ref is greater or I D is greater. One way is to put an ammeter in the drain and and physically subtract the reading of the ammeter from uh, reference current you wanted in the MOSFET in the first place. Another way is to simply monitor the node potential at, at the node x. If the potential at node x is rising with time, then it means that I ref is too large compared to I D. In which case, you have to reduce V G S. On the other hand, 
if the node potential at x is going down with time, then you know that the drain current is too large, which means that you have to reduce and looking at, if we just put that down, we see that when Vx is, uh, is reducing, we need to also reduce Vgs1. When Vx is increasing, we need to increase Vgs. So, one way of, of ensuring that is to simply connect Vx to Vg. And whenever you do things like this, you must ensure that the device still remains in the in the operating region which you intended it to be in and that was saturation and here you clearly see that shorting x to the gate still results in it's in saturation because vgs is equal to vds and if the drain and the gate are at the same potential then by definition the device is in saturation so if we hook the transistor up like this the voltage between the gate and the source is VGS1 which is that required to ensure that the drain current is exactly equal to air. Does it make sense? Now that we have figured it out, what do we do to bias our transistor? What did we say yesterday? We said that the problem candidate was that in our common source amplifier was that the gate source bias voltage was a fixed quantity, right? So, we had Ra parallel Rb and, and we had a fixed voltage which was yes, so some fixed voltage. This is Vdd and this is Rn. And the problem was that this voltage here in the gate is fixed and does not change with the threshold of the MOSFET. If the threshold varies, the current, the bias current in the MOSFET can vary because VGS is fixed. Okay? And now what have we done? Now look at these two circuits side by side. So, this was what we just figured out. And the, this kind of the way the drain is connected back to the gate ensures that the gate source voltage which is also the drain source voltage is exactly that needed to ensure that the transistor has got a, a bias current equal to IR. Now, on ICs yesterday I told you that if you make two transistors side by side then the two transistors will have the same threshold voltage and the same mu and CRs even though they might be off from what you thought they must have. So, this is a donkey, but this is an identical donkey. Alright? So, if I wanted to make sure that the drain current in, in this chap was the same as the drain current in this chap, which is, which happens to be equal to M1, IRF. And if I call this M2, the threshold and the mu and cox of M2 are exactly identical to the threshold and mu and cox of M1 because they are made on the same integrated circuit. So, any suggestions of what I can do to ensure that the drain current through M2 is exactly equal to IRF? I just connect X2 to Okay, first of all, whenever you make connections like this, you must make sure that you are not screwing up either of the circuits. Alright? So, will the node voltage at X remain VGS1 even after I make this connection? Yes. Why? No current uh, through the gate of M2, which means that there is no drop across RA parallel RB and since RA parallel RB just was, you know, came from another topology, it, it does not make any sense to carry this notation anymore, we just call this RB. So, if I now draw this the way it is drawn in the textbooks, the core of this circuit, this biasing arrangement is, is this, where I use M1 to fi figure out what voltage I need, so that the drain current is exactly equal to IR. And since M2 is identical to M1, I can use the same gate source voltage 
to excite M2. Alright, this is precisely what we have done here as far as the DC is concerned. Please note that there is no DC drop across RB. So, as far as DC is concerned, this is VDD, this is RL. What will be the drain current through M2? It will also be IRF provided I mean, will the current through M2 be IRF regardless of what RL there is or does the drain current of M2 depend on RL? No, come on, it does. Because if I remove RL, what happens to the drain current? I mean, if it doesn't depend on RL, I should be able to make RL any value and I should still get the same drain current. Correct? So, clearly it depends on RL. As long as M2 is in saturation, which means that VDD minus IRF times RL is greater than or equal to VGS1 minus VT, this ensures saturation as long as M2 is in saturation the current through the drain of M2 will also be equal to IRF. Does it make sense? And this is not particularly restrictive because we wanted the transistor M2 to be in saturation anyway, otherwise you will not get any incremental gain. So, this arrangement is a very very commonly used circuit arrangement used all over the place in ICs. Okay? For example, this was VDD, this was IRF, this was M1, assume M2, M3 and M4 are all in saturation, so that their drain potentials are sufficiently high voltages to ensure saturation. If that is the case, then what is the drain current of M2? Are all identical. Under these conditions, the drain currents of M2, M3 and M4 are all IRF. So, what have you done? You have taken one current source and made many copies of the same current. You understand? And this can be repeated ad infinitum, right? So, you can make uh, instead of having 2 to 4, you can have 2 to 40. You will have 40 current sources all pulling current down. The currents will all be equal to IRF. And this circuit arrangement is called the current mirror. And this is a very common technique used all the time in ICs. So, what all are you exploiting in a mirror? You are exploiting the fact that while each of the transistors might be a pretty crappy, right? When you make 10 of them on the same chip or a million of them on the same chip, they are all crappy to the same extent. So, you can use one transistor to figure out how bad it is and if you apply the same bias voltage to all the others, they will all do exactly the same. You understand? So, let us get back to how we can exploit this in our common source amplifier. So, you have IRF and this is the main transistor that this is RB RL and how do I complete the rest of the circuit? I need to add the source and the load. So, how would I add the source? What did I do last time? What is this? All that, all that this is is nothing but a smart replacement for the fixed battery. Okay? That's all. So, what should we do to add the input? What did we do with the input last time? 
we connect a capacitor, infinite capacitor like this, just as we did with the RS and this is the infinite capacitor and this we called RL1. So, the drain current of this transistor is exactly equal to IRF. Oh, first of all, can you comment on the uh, incremental gain from the input to the output? How will you choose RB? What is the exact value of the incremental gain from the input to the output? Okay, what is the incremental voltage at this point node? What is the incremental gain from input to x? Think carefully. What do you do? Okay, you don't know. What do you do? What would you do? You don't start guessing. What you will do is to do something, everything systematically, which is what? First job is to find the incremental equivalent circuit. So, how many nonlinear devices are there in this circuit? Okay, uh, what are the four? The VDD, the VDD is the same thing. We have IRF and IRF, VDD and the two transistors M1 and M2. You understand? Okay, find the incremental equivalent circuit. You replace every element by its, its incremental equivalent circuit. So, what happens to VDD? Becomes incrementally grounded. I mean, in increment equivalent, the IRF and all that doesn't make any sense because they're all quiescent quantities. What do you have? What will happen to this capacitor here? This capacitor will become a short circuit. Okay. What happens to this capacitor? This capacitor will become also a short circuit. What happens to the current source? Current source becomes an open circuit. And what should I do next? I should replace. every transistor by its incremental equivalent circuit and uh, what is the incremental equivalent circuit of this transistor of uh, this chap here? The transistor is operating in saturation. So, the incremental equivalent is the gate is uh, an open circuit and instead of the drain you have Gm times Vx. Okay. So, what about the, the incremental equivalent circuit of this guy? You figured out the region of operation of the transistor. Once you know the region of operation and the bias currents, you know the incremental equivalent circuit. You just pop, remove the transistor and pop the equivalent circuit in. Okay. So, what happens? There was a short between the gate and drain. All that I will do is cut and paste. This was the gate for information, this was the drain. So, what should I do? Replace the transfer. What region of operation? Saturation. So, in saturation, the transistor behaves like a voltage control current source. So, which voltage is controlling which current? Gate voltage is controlling drain current. Let me call this node Y. So, what is this current now? Is Gm Vy. Is this Gm the same as this Gm? Why? Same operating point, same transistor, everything is identical. Great. Okay. Now, this is the voltage Vy, the incremental voltage Vy. So, kindly look at this chap here. This voltage, incremental voltage was Vy, then the current flowing here will be Gm Vy. In other words, if I yank this node Y up by a small amount Vy, then a current is being sucked out of that node and that current is equal to Gm Vy. So, what is the what is the moral of the story? 
I have a black box. Okay? One, two nodes are coming out. One is ground. If I yank this by delta, some k times delta flows in. So, so this whole thing is a resistor of value 1 by k. Okay. Yes or no? Yes. So, I can replace this whole thing by a resistor of value. In other words, if I redraw this diagram. Okay. So, now what is the incremental gain from the input to the output? Okay. What is the incremental value voltage at x? Vs times Rb plus 1 over Gm by Rs plus Rb plus 1 over Gm times Vs is the incremental voltage at x. So, what is the incremental output voltage? It's the incremental, the incremental current is nothing but this is the, this is Vx. Gm times Vx is the incremental current to the drain. That times Rl parallel R1. Is there something missing? There must be a minus. Which means that the incremental gain is minus Gm times Rl parallel Rl1 divided by Rs plus Rb plus 1 over Gm times Rb plus 1 over Gm. And what are we used to, I mean uh, regarding the choice of Rb, what do we usually do? In our old first example, what did we choose? Typically Ra parallel Rb. So, I mean Rb was much larger than, we, we could choose Rb to be much larger than Rs. Okay? So, in other words, Rb is much, much larger than Rs, which means that if Rb is much, large, much larger than R, uh, Rs, then Rb plus 1 over Gm must also be much, much larger than Rs, which means that the incremental gain is approximately minus Gm times Rl parallel Rl1. Can somebody comment about the swing limits? Okay. Since the bias current is the same and the uh, uh, R L and R L 1 are all the same. We find that the swing limits are the same. Now, if the threshold of both the transistors changes by the same amount, can you comment on what happens to the gain? The incremental gain does not change even if the V T of the devices changes by any amount because if V T changes, VGS1 also changes so as to make sure that the drain current in M2 remains exactly equal to IR. This is certainly not true in the earlier case where we used a fixed voltage between the gate and the